Our next speaker today is Dr. Wayne Grody. Uh, Dr. Grody is a professor in the departments of pathology and laboratory medicine, pediatrics, and human genetics. He also directs the molecular diagnostic laboratories and the clinical genomics center at the UCLA School of Medicine. Dr. Grody. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, webinar series, which um, traces the history of cystic fibrosis carrier screening from its uh, inception that uh, Mike and I and others on, on this series were very involved in and uh, really brings it up to the most uh, recent news of the approval of, of uh, state-of-the-art new platforms. Uh, so I wanted to give kind of a history of uh, why we're even doing CF carrier screening, uh, how it got launched and uh, validated um, for what it has always been, you know, an imperfect test. It's, it's never going to pick up 100% of, of the mutations in this uh, large and complex gene, really, no matter w what technology uh, you use. And then a uh, little bit of a review of, of how it has actually played out in the last decade of, of uh, nationwide application. So uh, my first slide here just shows uh, the applications of molecular genetic testing. This would apply to many different diseases, not just cystic fibrosis. Uh, out of all of these, diagnosis, carrier screening, prenatal, newborn, and uh, presymptomatic diagnosis, which is usually done for later onset dominant diseases, uh, the one we're really focusing on uh, in this webinar series is carrier screening for recessive diseases. And CF has, has really become the prototype of that, especially to do the screening at the uh, DNA level. The reason for that is that the, the classical uh, clinical physiologic way to diagnose cystic fibrosis in an affected uh, <clears throat> child is by the uh, sweat chloride test. Uh, sodium and chloride are typically elevated in the sweat of CF patients. Um, but carriers of CF mutations who are heterozygotes have completely normal sweat tests. They're, they're not even in the high normal range usually. So that is not... Um, a viable option for uh, carrier screening. The IRT, the immunoreactive trypsin test, is um, used uh, really for only uh, newborn screening, and so uh, it's not used for carrier testing either. And really the only um, reliable way to identify carriers who are, are otherwise perfectly healthy uh, is by DNA analysis to find the heterozygous mutations uh, that they carry. Uh, of all the recessive diseases that we deal with in genetics, uh, of course, there's thousands of them, many in, of them incredibly rare. Uh, CF is said to be the most common potentially lethal recessive disease in the North American population, which, uh, of course, especially in the United States, is, is fairly ethnically diverse. But here you can see the, um, the typical carrier rates in Caucasians, uh, both uh, Jewish and non-Jewish. Hispanic Americans, African Americans, and Asian Americans. Um, the disease is fairly rare in Asians and, and then in Asian Americans as well. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about um, why all these groups have been included in the in the carrier screening. These carrier rates um, have felt, been felt to be high enough that it was justified to really consider doing population carrier screening, the goal of which would be to identify couples at risk where both the man and the woman are carriers, so they have a one in four chance of having an affected child, and um, then offer them prenatal diagnosis um, if they desire it. Uh, again, and it's been emphasized in other sections of this webinar series, because CF is a pure recessive, the carrier parents are completely healthy. There's often no prior family history of the disease, at least not in prior generations and they don't find out their carriers until they have a, an affected child. The goal of population-based carrier screening is to identify those at-risk couples before they have their first affected child and give them the option for prenatal uh, diagnosis. So like I said, this has to be done at the DNA level, and so it could not even be contemplated until the uh, gene for cystic fibrosis was discovered, and um, it was published in uh, several back-to-back -back papers in this issue of science in 1989. Uh, so there was great excitement at that point, uh, both about finding the gene and what it might mean for understanding the mechanism of the disease and potential uh, therapies, but also to give us the, um, the tools to actually do population-based carrier screening. It turned out that 
This was not launched uh, until about 11 or 12 years later. And the reasons were primarily due to the nature of the gene itself. Uh, CF is a relatively large gene, 250,000 nucleotides with many exons, a fairly large messenger RNA or cDNA, um, as we've heard about also in, in other parts of this webinar series. And similarly, the mutation spectrum is complex. That was not known in 1989 uh, when those original science papers were published. They uh, looked at just a few CF patients and found um, one particular mutation in about three-fourths of them, or 70 percent, which was uh, a three-nucleotide deletion of codon 508 coding for phenylalanine. And uh, this, of course, is the famous uh, delta F508 uh, mutation that is the um, most common uh, classical mutation in CF. Uh, it accounts for about 70 percent of the carriers in Caucasian populations, Caucasian non-Jewish populations. And if this had turned out to be the only mutation in the CF gene, or maybe one of three with maybe two others to be discovered later, uh, we would have launched population carrier screening uh, much earlier than it was actually done. But within months of the publication of those science papers, people began to report uh, the finding of many other disease variants within the CFTR uh, gene. Um, very soon there were 1,000 and then almost 2,000, uh, I think is about the number known uh, today. And of course there are also benign um, non-pathogenic variants or polymorphisms in the gene as well. As you can see from this relatively old mutation map, there are no real hot spots in the gene. You really do have to look at all the exons. And um, the only way to efficiently pick up at least most of these mutations would be um, screening, uh, sequencing of the uh, coding regions of the gene, which would be a very expensive and laborious uh, technique, not suitable for uh, population screening. So uh, we still keep track of uh, all the mutations in the CFTR gene. Uh, you can go to this website from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and um, it's a very up-to-date uh, list cataloging of, of all the known variants with references of what kind of patients they've been found in, as well as um, benign variants uh, as well. But of course, we can't use all of those for uh, carrier screening. So we were left with a dilemma. Um, do we choose a subset of the more common mutations? Uh, such as Delta F508, and at least screen with those. Therefore, you'd benefit at least the carriers who, who had those mutations, even though you'd miss the many other carriers who had other mutations. Unfortunately, in most ethnic groups, there is no second common mutation uh, anywhere near the, the prevalence of the Delta F508. In non-Jewish Caucasian populations, I, the next um, most common mutation is G542X which is found in about 2% of the carriers. So there's a big drop off uh, right after the Delta F508. The Ashkenazi Jewish population has another, a second more common mutation, W1282X, which does make the um, screening uh, more sensitive in, in that group. But for um, non-Jewish Caucasians and the other groups, uh, the Delta F508 will only give you a portion of the carriers, and then the others are comprised of many different mutations, um, many of which are very rare. So if we were going to proceed that way, we would have to choose some subset that would at least pick up some reasonable proportion of, of the carriers in, in the various ethnic groups. And the history of this was we decided, uh, it was decided that there be some funded pilot studies. Uh, these were uh, sponsored uh, by the um, what at the time uh, was the National Center for Human Genome Research, now it's the Institute, um, uh, and also funded by uh, NICHD and sponsored by the uh, ELSI uh, arm of the Genome Project. Seven groups uh, were funded. This was in the um, early to mid-1990s. Uh, I've drawn a line after the first five because uh, the goals of these two sets were a little bit different. The first five studies were doing pilot studies on the efficacy and acceptance of 
carrier screening in individuals with no family history of CF. The last two under the line were testing individuals who already had a family history of CF. And it was actually quite interesting that the attitudes of those people were uh, quite different, um, the attitudes toward prenatal carrier screening and potential prenatal testing were quite different in, in that group which was familiar uh, with the disease already. And so these various groups um, in their own locales uh, piloted uh, a type of CF carrier screening. Uh, we met and it was decided that based on our knowledge of the gene at the time, we would screen for what was known then as the six most common uh, mutations uh, in the gene. Of course, we've since discovered many, many others that could have been on this list. But you see them uh, listed here. And uh, we, there, the test methodology was uh, more primitive back then, needless to say. Um, all of the testing done for the seven groups uh, was done on these um, test strips uh, that uh, we worked with a, a company, Roche, at the time. Uh, these were prior to any of these being marketed, which are really a crude version of a, a DNA microarray where you have the probes uh, on the test strips. There's one box here for each of the six mutations. The spot on the left has the probe for the um, normal allele at that position in the gene. The spots on the right in each box are the abnormal allele. So the top strip here would be a person who's not a carrier of any of the six mutations. The second one would be a heterozygote for delta F508. Um, uh, the third one would be actually a homozygote for delta F508. That would uh, be a, an affected patient, most likely. Uh, the fourth one would be a carrier for the G542X, uh, and so on. And so this was the technology for the six mutations uh, studied during those uh, uh, the pilot phase uh, of the population carrier screening under NIH funding. Um, our own group, like all the others, um, wanted to see if there would be any adverse emotional effect of this testing. Would it make people anxious or depressed uh, in a way that we might do more harm than good? Uh, did they understand the nature of the test and what it meant to test positive or negative? And all of the groups, um, we're just showing the brochure for ours here, um, had numerous ways of conveying this information by brochures, by in-person counseling, uh, videos, and so on. Uh, we had a multi-ethnic population, so we had the materials in various languages. The subjects were quizzed. Uh, all the groups did this. Um, the ones who tested negative, which were, of course were the vast majority, uh, to see if they knew that there is still a residual risk of being a carrier after uh, they test negative for these six mutations. And the various groups got different uh, percentages of the wrong answer, which is the zero here. Uh, but those are the people uh, in whatever percentage who actually walk out of the testing with a false sense of security, thinking they have no chance to have a CF child. And um, that, that, of course, is incorrect. And somehow we need to make sure they, they don't have that misconception. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, even though we have much better technologies now with more mutations, you're still going to have some residual risk of being a carrier um, if you test negative, whatever the platform is. Uh, this is one of many ethical issues that uh, were raised uh, during uh, the pilot screening phase. Uh, and there are numerous others. Um, another one is illustrated here, which was from our own data after testing uh, 3,000 subjects. Uh, we had a multi-ethnic population, so it gave an aggregate carrier rate of almost about 1 in 60. So it's uh, less than the 1 in 29 if we were using only Caucasian subjects. So you have to screen quite a lot of individuals uh, to get a relatively small number of carriers. Our methodology was to approach uh, pregnant women in prenatal clinics, offer them the test if they were positive, we would invite their partner to come in, and then if he was positive, we would offer prenatal diagnosis. You can see at the bottom of this slide that uh, the partners also have a carrier rate of 1 in 60, so you end up with a very low number of at-risk couples after doing quite a lot of carrier screening. Various uh, medical economic studies have tried to model this and see if it costs more than the 
money you would save by preventing a CF birth. There's many different ways to look at that. With CF patients living on average now into their 30s and even 40s, but needing a lot of medical care, you could claim that each patient is costing one to two million dollars possibly, and that of course is way more than was spent on the carrier screening. But depending on how you model this, it, you could reach other conclusions probably. Uh, you do have the problem with these uh, couples where they have, uh, the woman, if you approach her first, has tested positive and then the partner is negative. What do you do with those couples? You've now made them anxious about a disease they had not really thought of before, because keep in mind these, uh, at least in our study and the first five studies, we're uh, focusing on individuals with no family history of CF. Now you've made them nervous about this disease they had no reason to think about before, and yet you don't have a whole lot to offer them, at least based on the studies we were uh, doing, because we were focusing on just those six mutations. In fact, uh, by initiating this carrier screen, you've actually raised their risk of having a CF child once they are positive negative compared to if you had done no screening uh, at all. So one solution to that that had been proposed was the couple screening model um, developed by Dr. Wald in the UK and used by uh, some groups in the United States where you test the man and the woman simultaneously. You report out if they're both negative or if they're both positive, you offer prenatal diagnosis. But if they are discordant, one positive and one negative, uh, that is just reported as negative for the couple. Therefore, you don't make them anxious. You don't proceed to any further testing. There have been some objections to this, and our own ACMG rec recommendations that emerged did not endorse this model, uh, mainly because of the, the non-disclosure part, that the person testing positive is never told that they were a carrier. Um, but some people still prefer this model. And then, as we know now, there are variants in the CF gene that um, cause either mild disease or phenotypes that don't even resemble uh, the classical lung disease of cystic fibrosis. Uh, probably the most famous of these variants is R117H, which depending um, what else is in the gene, which we will mention, can either cause um, very mild CF lung disease or no lung disease at all uh, and just a congenital malformation, absence of the vas deferens which produces male infertility. And that would not, we, we would assume, be a motivation for most couples to terminate a pregnancy if that was the only risk to their fetus. It would be irrelevant until the, the child is grown up anyway. And, um, and these men can still father children anyhow because they do make sperm and um, you can um, do the procedure of sperm aspiration and, um, and produce uh, pregnancies that way. So um, there are some subtleties about various uh, mutations and, and sequence variants in this gene that need to be taken into consideration. The recommendations emerged um, after 1997 when the investigators of all these uh, seven projects met at uh, NIH for a consensus conference where all the results were discussed. It happened to be at exactly the same time our own study was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And I'm mentioning this only because um, we had the highest uptake uh, and interest in carrier screening. I think it was only because we, we were uh, focusing the activity in prenatal clinics. It's been known for many decades that uh, for recessive diseases, people are much more interested in screening once they are already pregnant. If you approach them, in the preconception phase, which really would be preferable because they'd have more options at that point for reproduction. Um, unfortunately, you don't get much interest or follow through. They, they're just not thinking about this kind of thing at that stage. So on the last day of this three-day conference, the um, consensus panel issued this press release recommending that this be the model for CF carrier screening nationwide that it be offered to all pregnant couples and also those pr planning a pregnancy, although in, in actual practice you don't get that many of the uh, preconception uh, couples coming in for this. The panel did not specify uh, 
how many mutations um, should be offered out of the 1,800 or so uh, in the gene. So that was left to a committee of the American College of Medical Genetics. This was the publication after three years of deliberation uh, in 2001, where all of the mutations uh, in the gene were examined for frequency and phenotypic severity. And a subset based on that was uh, decided on as the core panel. I'll go over briefly the uh, major recommendations uh, from that paper, which still exist uh, today. So this is the guideline uh, accepted by both the American College of Medical Genetics and uh, the American College of OBGYN uh, for population carrier screening in couples with no family history of the disease. Uh, it was decided to be pan-ethnic. I won't go over the subtleties here about offered versus made available, but basically uh, all couples must be told about it. Uh, the reason is we did not want to put the onus of ascertaining ethnicity onto uh, the average obstetrician uh, in such a heterogeneous population of the U.S. where many people themselves don't know their own ethnicity. We, as I said, did not endorse the non-disclosure couple screening model. We said you could screen the couple together as long as both of them get both results. And then we came up with this core mutation panel, which I will show. It was based on a series of many thousand affected CF patients that were in a database from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and who had been genotyped, at least using the DNA technology of that time. And we ranked all the mutations based on their prevalence within that cohort. Any mutation that accounted for 0.1% or greater of that group was included in, in the core testing panel, which is now uh, shown here. Uh, it turned out to be 25 mutations, which was sort of a nice round number. It does include the R117H, as I've noted here. And this one did require special attention because we were never charged with screening the population for male infertility. Uh, that was not considered to be a life and death uh, issue. And yet R117H was common enough that we didn't feel we could leave it off the panel. And as I mentioned, it does cause CF uh, sometimes. Its expression depends on its association with uh, a run of T's, thymines, in an intron of the gene. And this gets somewhat complicated, but um, we have other experts in this webinar series uh, who've done much of the work on this. Uh, it's summarized here, and it's even more complex than this because there are other elements in the gene that can then modify this. But the major modifier is the number of thymines in this intron and whether it, they are in the same allele in cis or in the opposite allele in trans of the R117H mutation. The 5T is the most pathologic one. It affects um, RNA processing and splicing. If you have 5T in cis in the same allele with the R117H, you do get the disease cystic fibrosis, although it may be somewhat mild or moderate. If you have a run of 7Ts in the same allele, you don't get CF. You get congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens, in other words, male infertility. Similarly, if the 5T is in the opposite allele, in trans, you only get the vas deferens malformation. And then what was problematic is if you're homozygous for the 5T, even in the absence of any other CF mutation, you get the absence of the vas deferens. That's why there's a reflex test for the 5T. You only do that test if you find the R117H in either of the parents because we didn't want to be doing primary screening for male infertility, which you would pick up in people who were 5T, 5T homozygotes. So you wait to see if the person has the R117H, then you reflex uh, for the 5T. As shown in the bottom, the 5T is not uncommon in the general population. So if that was the primary screen, you would be picking that up more than you would want to deal with. To continue with the guidelines, um, the dilemma about the discordant or positive-negative couples. 
as I said, they've now become somewhat anxious, although most of our studies, when we actually did mood questionnaires, did not really see much significant anxiety in those who, who were positive negative, but at least theoretically, you've raised them to a, a higher risk level. And should they then be offered a, an extended mutation panel of, of more mutations to see if you can maybe pick up a r more rare mutation in, in the um, spouse that tested negative on, on the first six. This we did not encourage, but this has been an issue of widely divergent views ever since then, as we'll mention. Uh, we have uh, statistics about residual risk, which I will show. This was in the appendix of the paper, and that's how you do the counseling of those who test negative. We recommended that any primary care providers, especially obstetricians, who are not comfortable with, with this kind of thing should refer the couple for genetic counseling. And the usual quality of standards for all molecular genetic testing uh, would fall, would be um, operative here. This is from the appendix of the paper showing the detection rate of uh, the 25 mutations in the core panel in the various ethnic groups, at least as known at the time, and their uh, residual risk after testing negative. You can see, as I alluded to before, the Ashkenazi Jewish population actually has the most robust test here because the vast majority of those carriers either have Delta F508 or the W1282X. Um, it's a little less, 80% um, detection rate in non-Jewish Caucasians, and you can see the rates in the uh, other groups. Um, we wish they were higher, and that's why many people have proposed a more extensive mutation panels, as we'll talk about. But um, as long as the counseling is accurate and they understand what their residual risk is, it was felt that this was, would still be an adequate screening test. Uh, there are certain elements that must be in the CFTR carrier screening report. Uh, you really should say why the test was done because it has different value and different meaning if you're using whatever DNA technology it is to detect uh, carriers in a screen versus, let's say, carriers in a uh, person who has a brother with CF. They have a much higher a priori risk to be a carrier. And if this test were negative, you would be justified looking uh, at more rare mutations in that person. Also, carrier screening is much different than diagnostic testing in a patient with symptoms. And if the basic panel was negative in such a child, but you still suspected CF, you might want to go to some larger panel or even full gene sequencing, something we wouldn't do for carrier screening. You should state the method used because that will give the ordering physician an idea of what the um, pickup rate and, and um, uh, intended use uh, would be, such as sequencing versus targeted uh, mutation testing as we use for carrier screening. The number of mutations tested, is, whether it's the core panel or more, residual risk we've talked about, the um, other genotype phenotype correlations, which apply to especially R117H, but some of the other mutations, um, you could mention literature that showed there was maybe more of a um, variety of their clinical phenotype. We did try to pick mutations that generally produce classical CF, although it, you cannot predict that 100% even with Delta F508. And then recommendation for any follow-up action, such as testing the partner, prenatal diagnosis, and so on. So as I mentioned, this was endorsed by ACOG and was considered standard of care after a several month ramping up, ramping up period. So around 2002, this was felt to be standard of care that all couples must at least be offered the carrier screen. And if they decline, make sure to put that clearly in the uh, medical records. This is sort of what I call the post-market surveillance. So if we go from 2001 or two to the present day, Initially, there were concerns about uh, how many obstetricians were actually offering this to their patients. It started out low, as you would expect, and took a while to ramp up. But um, it, we try to keep tabs on this, and certainly seems like a wide majority of them now offer it. Anyone that doesn't, of course, would be at risk of uh, a lawsuit if the 
couple gave birth to an affected child and had not been offered the screening. One of the mutations, a single nucleotide deletion, 1078 del T, was found to be less common, much less common than we had expected, and people just are not seeing it at all. So it was uh, actually removed from the panel. A more problematic one is the I148T, a missense uh, variant that actually turned out to be far more common in screening than we would have predicted from the affected child registry we had used. And it turned out on further study that this variant is just a, um, a benign variant, a, a polymorphism, does not cause any disease at all. And the affected patients who had this one actually had another real mutation on the same allele. So needless to say, this has been removed as well. And then we've had some problems with um, expansion, or what I call mutation panel inflation, uh, over the years. So this was the updating of the guideline published in 2004, which, um, among other things, removed those two variants. So now we're at a 23 mutation uh, panel. So um, as I mentioned, there's the screening panel inflation. And that had started actually quite early. The very next issue of the journal Genetics and Medicine, where the guidelines were, were uh, published, had a paper from uh, another group that was claiming higher uh, pickup rate of carriers if you expanded the panel to as many as 93 mutations. And there have been many others since then uh, that have added various numbers, high, at least higher than the 23, some as high as uh, 200. This has concerned some of us within the ACMG, and we published uh, this commentary talking about what was called the CF mutation arms race, with various groups trying to outdo each other um, in some way for marketing purposes to claim you have more mutations or variants. Of course, we know more about this now uh, than we did then, because DNA sequencing has become much more ro robust in their intervening years. But these were some of the concerns we talked about, why this might not be desirable, at least not without further studies. Um, it departs from the standard of care, which we, could, of course, could revise. But until it's revised, the standard of care is the 23 mutations. Um, there is more cost, usually, by doing more, more mutations, although not always, depending on the platform. You're still not going to pick up all carriers. So it may give people an even more false sense of security, thinking they've had a really comprehensive panel when, when no targeted panel is ever comprehensive. Many of the variants on these expanded panels are incredibly rare. And the, the clinical documentation in the literature of what they cause um, is not so great as far as the genotype-phenotype correlation. Uh, you could just say, well, why don't we look at all the mutations by full gene sequencing? But as we mentioned, that would really be too expensive for carrier screening. And it would have the downside. You'd also pick up a lot of variants of unknown significance whenever you do non-targeted sequencing. Um, further down in this list uh, is the paradox of dwindling predictive value. And that uh, refers to uh, the equation for predictive value that we use in laboratory medicine, which has to do with prevalence of what you are looking for, whether it's a disease or an antibody. In this case, it's a DNA variant. If that target is incredibly rare in the general population, so rare that you, hard, you hardly ever get a positive result in your testing, there's actually more likelihood that the one day you do get a positive that it would be a false positive due to technical problems rather than a biologic positive, simply because the, the incidence of false technical positives is going to be higher uh, than the, the real biologic ones. And some of the extended panels have specifically advertised that they are better for certain ethnic groups, such as Hispanic Americans. Um, and that, for one thing, remains to be seen. And secondly, some of the groups targeted have been uh, not that receptive to this kind of screening in the first place. So in a way, you could argue we need to address social issues and access issues before we uh, try to target a lot of so-called ethnic-specific uh, mutations. The outcomes uh, that we've followed so far 
um, have generally uh, echoed the Kaiser uh, experience, where um, they have screened uh, their population within Kaiser, primarily Caucasian, at least what's been reported, uh, getting the typical 1 in 28, 1 in 29 incidents. And they were able to reduce the incidence of CF in their birth population by 50%. In fact, the incidence of unwanted CF births was reduced to zero. So the couples that still had a CF child, it wasn't because of any mistake. Uh, it was simply because those couples, although they had been through the carrier screening and even the prenatal diagnosis, then could not actually face the thought of terminating the pregnancy and, and went on with it. And that seems to be what we're finding nationwide, that about 50% of couples with an affected child are going on with the pregnancy. In a way, that's not surprising, because CF um, is perceived by people as not being so terrible as other kinds of congenital problems that, that have major physical malformations or, or mental retardation, uh, things like trisomy 18 and so on. Uh, CF doesn't have those things, so the parents are um, perhaps more apt to go on with the pregnancy. These are uh, the various methods and platforms that um, are used. I think that the reverse hybridization blocks that I showed you an example of in the pilot studies have uh, pretty much gone away now uh, in favor of the, all these other techniques. There are numerous vendors for these. A number of these platforms are FDA approved. Uh, others are not or are in the process. Uh, of being approved. Sanger sequencing, of course, is what we would use to do the full sequencing of the gene. We reserve that, uh, as most people do, for uh, trying to make a diagnosis in a child with atypical symptoms. It would really not be the right technique for carrier screening. It takes too long, it's too expensive, and, and you get variants of uncertain significance. What's changed, of course, is now we have next generation DNA sequencing which um, is much more robust and allows you to actually sequence the entire genome in the time it would have taken you to sequence just part of a gene uh, by Sanger sequencing. Now, it'll still turn up variants of uncertain significance, but it does allow you to contemplate um, looking at the whole gene or at least targeting a much uh, larger subset of, of the mutations if you've decided uh, what to do there. And that's where the uh, CFTR2 project from Dr. Cutting's group uh, comes into play, uh, being discussed in other segments of this webinar series, where there's now uh, both physiologic and genetic evidence for including a larger panel of, of mutations uh, and doing that by next generation sequencing. And uh, a method for that actually just got FDA approval shortly before this webinar series uh, was produced. I think we'll probably see more of that kind of thing going into the future since next generation sequencing appears to be taking over all, all of the other platforms that we were previously using. So that brings up the question um, of what kind of carrier screening should go beyond this. And uh, Dr. Gregg is discussing that in his part of the webinar. Um, you could now more practically than you could ever do before. Look for many more CF mutations, but also look for mutations in thousands of other uh, recessive disease genes. So I've highlighted here, if you were going to do universal whole genome or whole exome sequencing, uh, who would you apply it to, to? There's been discussions and studies about doing it on all newborns or all adults. Uh, but I've highlighted here couple screening because it's relevant to our topic today. CF is just one of many thousands of recessive diseases that you could screen for now uh, give, given this new technology. So theoretically, you might be able to alert couples that they are at risk for any of these thousands of rare uh, recessive diseases, not just cystic fibrosis or the Ashkenazi Jewish diseases or whatever they would normally get offered. Uh, for now, um, it's important to remember that the CF carrier screen by DNA testing uh, was the first universal DNA test ever proposed, um, and it still is the only one uh, 
the others used are still ethnic specific. But if we move into next generation sequencing, I think uh, it would become universal uh, at that time. The problem, of course, is uh, all of the other variants and, and incidental findings you'll get by next generation sequencing, not just in the CFTR gene, but in every other gene you look at. And so the test um, reporting and counseling and interpretation become uh, far, far more complex. You'll, you're going to have to deal with the incidentalome, um, which is all of the other thousands of variants you get beyond the subset of mutations you were actually targeting. So I think before we launch into uh, next generation sequencing beyond the CF gene itself, uh, we need to think carefully about the potential downsides and the, the workload and the counseling resources that would be needed for that. And on that note, uh, with a view to the future, um, I will stop there and um, we'll go on to the next uh, segment in the webinar. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Grody.